Welcome back to the Hidden Structures Bootcamp Series. This is our final video. In this video, we look at 16 card packets. So we will begin with a, quote, traditional Max Maven routine, and then we'll look at a couple of variations that I've created. Okay, this first effect is fairly similar looking to the 14 card Max Maven effect in that there are two phases. But these two phases are quite different, as you'll see. Okay, so what we need here are 16 cards. So what I've done is I've grabbed all of the face cards together with the four aces, okay? So we have two black aces, two red aces, two black jacks, and so forth. Okay, so we have these companion pairs of aces, jacks, queens, and kings. So as you might imagine, those are the cards to match up at the end if we can. So right now, you know that this is an AMP and we need it to be a mirrored structure for any Max Maven routine. So the fastest way to convert it to a mirrored structure is to perform an over under or under over. So a mange shuffle. So let's go ahead and just do an over, under, 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 over. Okay, this is guaranteed to be mirrored now. Okay, so as you come in from either end, you can see companion pairs all the way to the center cards, which appear to be the two black aces. Okay, so this is all set up for a Max Maven routine. Now, as you know, if you've been watching videos in this series, there are many, many different mixing routines we could have done from its first state as an AMP, or now as a mirrored structure, we can actually mix it considerably before we even begin. Now, what we could do just to do at least some minimal mixing, and this could be done in front of the spectator, is to do this left-right shuffling, as we've done. Now, we know by the stay stack principle that that mirrored structure is unharmed. Now, it is permuted, and you can see that right here. Cards have, are moving around. In fact, look here. The black aces that were actually together in the middle are now quite far apart from each other, but they're still in a mirrored relationship. Okay, so we could mix this quite a bit before we even begin, but we do need to bring it back to a mirrored structure. As is the case with every Max Maven routine, the goal is to deal these out into two piles. You can even have the spectator do this, and the hope is that you'll be able to get matching mates there, companion cards. Now I'm going to go ahead and move this piece of paper for a second so that we can work. Okay, so uh, we've done, uh, I'll do another left, right, and the hope is we can get these cards to match up as companion. Nope, that's a fail. Okay, we're going to do something that we've alluded to before, but we really haven't done during a Max Maven routine, and it's a kind of a desperate attempt to get something to match here. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to deal them out into four piles, left to right. Now the hope is that we can get at least two of these to be companion pairs. Nope, nope. No, we needed black kings there and black aces as well, actually. <laughs> So that would be a fail. And these can be stacked from left to right or right to left. Okay, uh, you can do as many of those as you like and it ends up that you will never get two companion cards appearing at the top of those four piles. Okay, so now once the spectator is convinced there's something funny about these cards or they've got to be the most unlucky person alive. Uh, what we're going to do now is go ahead and try to enable a win by using Max Maven's traditional routine. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is a two phase. So the phase one is we deal out two piles of eight cards. 
Now, when you see that statement, it actually means to deal them out as we're doing here, left, right, left, right, left, right. You don't do one, two, three, four, five, up to eight, and then the other eight go there. You really do need to do a left, right deal, which is normally how most people deal out cards into two piles. Okay, so the claim here is that the top card can be chosen from either pile. This is a choice the spectator can make. So maybe they choose this one right here, okay? This is the card they've chosen. It came from here. Now what we need to do is we need to pick up the other pile and perform the Australian down under, okay? Now if the spectator has not seen this before, it's quite a fun shuffle to watch and witness it being done, okay? Just because of the nature of the down under movement of the cards. So we go down, under, down, under, down, under, down, under, down, under, down, under, down. Okay, so how did we do? Did we finally succeed in finding the companion, a companion pair? We did indeed. We found the red kings. Very, very good. Okay, well that's phase one. You can actually do a second phase here, phase two. Now these both, these piles consist of seven cards each. And if you remember, seven is a special number relative to the lone survivor principle, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to perform the under-down deal on each one of these individually, okay? So that's actually different than anything we've done before with a, a two-phased routine. Okay, so what that means is you just pick up the packet and when it's under-down, we often cast it in the language of she loves me, she loves me not, if you remember that. So we say, she loves me, she loves me not. She loves me, she loves me not. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, she does. Okay, now on its own, what does that tell us? Not much, but we still have one more pile to work with. So we're going to perform the under, down, or she loves me, she loves me not, on the second pile. She loves me, she loves me not, she loves me, she loves me not, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes. And indeed, look at what we've done. We have found all four kings, and we have matched them up by color. So that is Max Maven's 16 card effect that consists of two separate phases. Okay, now as I've mentioned before regarding Max Maven's original routines, which are all wonderful, and he was the first one to even come up with these ideas of uh, marrying the stay stack principle with the lone survivor principle. So to my knowledge, it, this idea of combining those is original to him. Um, but nonetheless, his traditional performances normally lead to discard piles, the cards that remain at the end that have not been paired up in some way. Uh, normally those are unstructured and sometimes completely muddled packets that cannot be used as is, okay? Which means you really can't do much after this. You won't know much about the discard pile that I had just a moment ago, okay? Or the two discard piles. I guess we had two piles, didn't we, of six cards each. Okay, so what we're going to look at next are the variations that I've come up with on Max Maven's game protocol. The advantage to my variations, of course, as you've seen already throughout the course, is that my discard piles are either incredibly nice, like this one, or fairly nice, like the one for the LR deal variation, okay? 
So we do get either highly structured or at least semi-structured packets at the end, which then can be recycled into additional Max Maven-like routines. Okay, so for my Max Maven variations, this first one is a Klondike shuffle variation, um, I will need a mirrored structure just as in the traditional performance. Now, as you can tell, this is an AMP again, and it's not in the same order that the original one was. Um, when it comes to an AMP, it actually doesn't matter what order the pairs are placed within the packet. It makes no difference whatsoever. So I just quickly reassembled this. Now, since this is an AMP, to get a mirrored structure, as you know, Perhaps the fastest way of doing that is to perform a manche, as we did earlier. So maybe we'll do an under over in this time instead. So this is where you deal off the top card and then you go under, over, 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 under. These are new cards, so they're a bit slippery. Okay, so we know that this is a mirrored structure now, okay? And that's something you can check on your own as you're working this after you've done the Klondike Shuffle and you started with an AMP, you are guaranteed to get a mirrored structure every time. Okay, um, as we mentioned before, this could be mixed considerably using our diagram. Let me bring that up just for a moment to remind you of all of the different shuffles that we can actually do with this packet of 16 cards. In fact, I guess I should point out that, and I apologize for it to be, for being so small here, but, um, okay, so we have a mirrored structure, right? So a mirrored structure is over here, right there that where that little circle is. Now these are structure preserving shuffles here. All of those are, okay? So there's quite a list of shuffles that could be performed right now that would not hurt that mirrored structure. I do want to point out though, we, we have these special shuffles that apply to a packet of size 4N, so the blue. The blue is for packets of size 4N and the green down here is for packet sizes of 8N, which is what we have. We have 16 cards. So these two green ones down here, if you go on and take the Hidden Structures online course, we can actually use those for this particular packet, um, if it happened to be a two-cycle structure, okay? So we started down here, just to remind you, we had an AMP, and then we came up to in fact, what we did, let's really review this. So we were down here at an AMP, we came up to a mirrored structure, and we performed the manche to do that. Well, that's not the only way to get there, as you can see over here. Uh, but in some ways, it's the, the most economical way of getting there. Okay, so there we are. We are where we need to be. We have a mirrored structure. Okay. So this would begin just like a traditional Max Maven routine, where the goal is to deal these out so perfectly so that the top cards are companion cards. Nope, that would be a fail. Okay, and you can do that as many times as you like, or have the spectator do that as many times as they like. Why don't we go ahead and do um, four and then eight again, just to kind of show you that. So, so in the hopes of at least getting a pair of companion cards, or if we're really lucky, maybe we'll get two pairs of companion cards. Let's go ahead and deal out into four piles. Nope, not even the same value. Oh, those are the same value, but different colors. So that's a fail. Didn't get a match there. You can do as many of those as you like, stacking from left to right or right from left. And we also showed you that hopping stacking, where if you hop over, if we have one, let me just show you here. Let me just show you here with, I'll just put out four cards. 
I'm just demonstrating another stacking that you can do. So you can actually go like that. It's kind of like leapfrogging over the one next to it with random stack here. And you can do that hopping over from left to right or right to left. So I just wanted to uh, mention that again. You've seen me do that a couple of times in, in the series, and I'm not sure if I ever stopped to explain that. But, uh, but that follows from the stay stack principle. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to put out eight piles and just hope to high heaven that we get at least one pair of companion cards. This is kind of kind of like that matching game, children's game, where you're you're trying to get at least a pair. So how are we doing? We don't have any. We have. You know, same value, but not the same color. Same value, different color. Oh, same thing with the jack, actually. <laughs> and so that is, unfortunately, a fail. We did not get a single pair of companion cards. Now, if you think about that happening by chance alone, that's actually not very likely that you would fail and not get a single pair of companion cards, okay? And what is perhaps even more amazing is that you can do that as many times as you like. Deal out into eight piles, reveal the top cards, and you will never ever get a pair of companion cards, ever, okay? So after the spectators convinced that the universe is against them and they're just hoping that maybe they can have some success. What we're going to do now is we're going to do this Max Maven variation using the Klondike Shuffle. Okay, so you deal out one more time and you ask the spectator to use their intuition to choose the top card of either packet. And really emphasize that this is an important choice because you know, if, if one of these is going to work for us and the other one's not, they have kind of a 50-50 chance. So they're really going to have to feel confident with their choice. So maybe they decide to go with this one here as their choice. Okay, now you as the performer need to remember you have eight cards here. You have seven cards here, right? And... Since these were mirrored piles, remember this came from here. This card here is the companion card to the bottom one here. Okay, you remember that? And if, if that's not clear, then maybe watch some of the earlier videos where we talk about mirrored piles. Okay, so that's the property of these piles here. That this card here is quote, paired up with the bottom card there. So they're the mirrored image of each other. That's why we call them mirrored piles. Okay, so if the card of interest is at the bottom, and when we put these together, we're going to have an odd size packet followed by a Klondike shuffle, where do we want that special card to be? So an odd size packet when Klondike Shuffle will always bring that middle card to the top. It'll be the last one shuffled, right? So if we want this to be the lone survivor, the one at the very end, we need to make sure it's in the middle of this larger packet of 15 cards. Now it is, because it's the eighth card down with seven cards below it. So it is in the middle position. So now when we perform the Klondike Shuffle, remember that's where you take the top and bottom off as one, okay? Now if you have an old deck, you have to be careful that the cards uh, don't stick. And of course, since we had 15 cards and these are all pairs, we'll have a little loan card here. Well, the fact is it's going to be the matching mate the companion card to that one there, guaranteed. Okay, so we finally had some success. Now what's wonderful about this variation, as I mentioned, is that this discard pile of 14 cards is highly structured. We have one revealed pair, which is right here, 
and then this is a packet of 14 cards that actually forms an AMP. Now remember, an AMP is where you have the matching mates in pairs moving from the top down. Okay, so this is like we've started over the whole thing over except for the fact that we have 14 cards now. Okay, so from here you could actually perform the 14 card Max Maven routine that we talked about in one of the previous videos. So everything that we did with 14 cards in that vi earlier video we can do to this packet now because this is a 14 card AMP packet. Okay, now here's another choice. Of course, you can always just take these cards and if you just nonchalantly put those on top, where are you? You're back to the beginning with a 16 card AMP. What does that mean? That means you could start this whole thing over again and maybe finish, in fact, maybe we'll do that, we'll finish with the other variation. Okay, so you could, you could do this one with the Klondike and then the packet easily resets so that you can start over and now maybe we'll do the second variation so you can see that involving the LR deal. Okay, um, I do also want to mention that since this is an AMP, you really could do any of the previous routines involving 12 cards, 10, 8, 6, okay, where you had AMP packets of those sizes, okay. So really with this packet of 16, you can essentially do everything <laughs> that we've done before in earlier videos, okay. You're all ready to go. You just have to choose the right number of cards to work with. Okay, so um, so this is an LR deal variation for the traditional Max Maven. And that was the very first one we showed you today. Now we need a mirrored structure for every Max Maven routine. That's the case here as well. So here we are with an AMP. Well, we need a mirrored. Let's just do it over under as we've done uh, twice already now. <laughs> so you guys are going to get very, very good at the over under or under over. Okay, that's guaranteed to be mirrored. Now you don't show the spectator that it's mirrored, right? I mean, you don't show them. And when they watch that shuffle, 99% of people watching that shuffle find that shuffle so confusing and convoluted that they would never even dream that the cards are in some kind of special order that's going to help you as the performer. At least that's been my experience. No one's ever said, oh, I think that's in a special order of this kind and it's, it's the reason the whole thing works. Uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think I'll ever find somebody, unless they're already familiar with these principles, who will be able to detect that. Okay, so we have a mirrored structure now. It always begins the same with this game protocol, Max. I call it the Max Maven game protocol, where we're trying to get the top cards to match. We're trying to get companion cards. That's a fail. And so we can do left, right, left, right, reveal as many times as you like. You can also deal one, two, three, four, and then you know build those piles up one level at a time, reveal the tops, and you'll never find a pair of companion cards. And then you can even deal into eight piles from left to right and reveal the top cards and you won't find a single pair of companion cards as we've seen already, okay? And so once the spectators convince that, boy, it's really, really difficult to get these cards to match up, you say, well, let's try something different this time. Let's go ahead and just deal them out one more time and working together exerting our faith and hope in the universe together. Maybe we can get something to happen that's, <laughs> that's helpful. Okay, so what I need you to do is uh, use your intuition to choose the top card of either pile, and maybe they choose this one this time. Just set it there. Say, very good. Now, just, th I'm speaking to you as the performer now. Um, just as we needed for the Klondike Shuffle, we needed the card of interest to be in the middle position, 
right? So we'll need to do the same sort of thing here. So we'll back up again. Sorry, I, sh I probably should have pointed this out. Remember, these are mirrored piles. In fact, maybe to strengthen your faith, let me just show you that. So this card here is the Ace of Diamonds. It's guaranteed to be the companion card to the bottom one here. That's just the nature, nature of these mirrored piles. And that follows from the stay stack principle. Okay. Well, since you've seen those, maybe we'll choose this one instead. But that's the idea that this top card is the companion to the bottom one of the other pile. Okay. So what that means then is we want that bottom card in the middle of this, this packet of 15 cards. Well, think about it. We have eight here and seven here. So we want their special card in the eighth position from the top. So what we would need to do is just take this larger pile and set it on top of this pile of seven cards. So now it is sandwiched perfectly in the middle. And now the LR deal, a repeat LR deal, is where we do the following. We deal from left to right, and then you retain the odd-sized packets. And there's kind of, there's an obvious reason for doing that because what we want to do is we want to whittle this down to just one card in the end, just one card. And we want it to be the final card produced by this system of left-right dealing. Okay, we have what, uh, three, six, we have eight cards here and we have seven cards over here. So this is a discard pile, right? We discard that. We keep the odd size pile. So here it's the smaller pile, smaller of the two. So you can just set this aside. This is a discard pile. Now, as we'll see, it has a fairly decent structure though, right? <laughs> we'll look at that at the end. Okay, and so we just continue on. We're doing this left-right dealing and then eliminating the even size piles and keeping the odd size piles. So here we have three, so we'll set this one aside. We don't need those. So now we're down to three. And so dealing these left, right, left, right will end with a single card on its own, namely this card here. And we're just hoping that this is the companion card to that one. So we're hoping for the Jack of Diamonds. And we indeed got the Jack of Diamonds. Okay, so that is the LR deal variation that I came up with. Um, now I mentioned over here that this packet of eight cards, remember we have eight cards here, is a mirrored structure right now. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> this, this is mirrored relative to card value and color. So companion cards, companion cards as you come into the middle, those two black queens. That's a mirrored structure relative to value and color. Wonderful. The little packet of four cards right here is also mirrored. Isn't that great? And by the way, this will always happen. It doesn't matter how you're doing the left-right dealing and so forth or what decisions were made earlier. Um, as long as you start with a mirrored packet, right, you have to kind of follow that main initial assumption about how you start. And then we, it claims right here we have a pair, a pair of what? A pair of, a companion pair of cards. Isn't that great? And then we have our revealed pair, R is for revealed, revealed pair, okay? So what we have here then, if you think about it, we have a couple of companion cards. If I put those together, this is a little baby <laughs> AMP. Right? And then this is a four card mirrored structure and this is an eight card mirrored structure. Okay? So there's a number of ways to finish from here actually if you wanted to. What we could have done, let's just go back in time for a second. Not too far back. I'm going to just put that back. Put this back. Now we had just revealed these, maybe in the opposite order. And then we had these, uh, another we had another discard pile, okay? Um, well, knowing that this is an eight pile mirrored structure, we could actually go back and do a Max Maven routine that involves eight cards. That would work just fine. Um, 
but a, a wonderful way to work finish here is is to say, wow, okay, you finally got two to, to match. Isn't that wonderful? After all of those failed attempts, we finally succeeded. Well, I, I have a feeling that you maybe did even better than just this. I, I have a feeling that, let's see, yes. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I have a feeling that these are companion cards too. And they are indeed. And over here, hmm, are these companion cards? Uh, no, I don't think so. But I have a feeling that they're on opposite ends of each other. So if I go like that, I get a pair. Oh, I get two red queens. Hmm, I wonder if that clever little thing will work for these as well. Let's see. Ah, that's not likely, is it? Oh, well, well, it's probably not likely, but it happened. Oh, no way, no way. We're going to have to fail at some point. Oh, I can't believe this. We got every single one of those companion cards matching up perfectly. How in the world did you do that? With your perfect choice making along the way. Even though just a few moments ago, it looked like failure was our future. Utter failure was our future. And somehow look at what you've done. Isn't that amazing? So uh, that is the second Maxim Maven routine that I've come up with. And um, I like Max Maven's original ones. And perhaps what I like most about these is the fact that he even discovered and, and pointed me and perhaps others, I don't know of any others, but perhaps others to um, study what is really going on with these routines mathematically. And that has led to a lot of wonderful results that I don't think I would have even thought to look for if Max Maven hadn't pointed the way. So um, I do appreciate his work. Okay, very good. Now there is something special about a 16 card packet that we really should talk about. So let me bring up our little diagram here. So down here under Lone Survivor, now I've essentially written all of that information over here plus some uh, because I know that's very, uh, very small for you <laughs> to read on the screen. Um, uh, but the Lone Survivor for the Under Down and Down Under deal um, is very nice if it's a power of two. So we saw that with eight. Eight is two cubed, and so some wonderful things happen there. Now we've hit another power of two, two to the fourth. Okay, so recall how this works. So for the lone survivor principle for the under down deal, and so that's the one where we, we say, she loves me, she loves me not, you know, as we move the cards about, right? So how this works is you take the packet size and then you write it as the highest power of two that is less than or equal to the number and then there may be a remainder needed to actually get equality. Well, in this case, there's no remainder needed. The, the remainder is zero, okay? So for the under down deal, and this is going back several videos, if you recall, once you've actually express the packet size as the power of two plus a remainder to find the position of the lone survivor it's going to be two times your remainder this is l right here l is zero plus one so if you do the calculation there it's two times zero which is zero plus one so it comes out to just be one and then recall that when you have a packet so you have a top card you have a top chord, second, third, fourth, fifth, all the way to, down to the bottom. Remember, the top card is denoted or labeled with a one. Okay, so that's the correct labeling for the position of those cards. The top card is position one, all the way down to the bottom card. Now the bottom card, in the case of this power of two, the bottom card actually will be labeled zero, okay? And so if you want to think about 16 is 0 modulo 16, okay? 
So the, ne the numbering is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 15, and then, quote, 0 for the bottom. Okay, why is that important? Well, it's important here, right? Because for the down under, the only difference is they're off by just one position here. And that makes sense because here you're putting the top card under and then the next one down. So you're really getting rid of the even position cards when you do that. And then here, the down under, well, that first card set down is the top card, which has position one, so it's kind of killed off. So the down under gets rid of all of the odd position cards and keeps the even position cards. And then with our formula here, two times L, where L is zero, we get a position of zero. Well, what that denotes simply is the bottom card of the packet. Okay, so how you do this then is you, you can be given any packet, any packet of 16 cards. Okay, so we have this, uh, we have this packet that we've been using, right? So let me just kind of mix it a little bit here. So you just ask the spectator and say, can you hand me any 16 cards whatsoever? Okay, well, uh, one thing you can do, I mean, this is just something fun you can do with the Lone Survivor Principle in this case, is for a packet of 16 cards, um, you just ask for those back from the spectator, okay? So what you could do is just show them the cards and, and ask them if they're happy with the order of the cards. So you're kind of ostensibly just showing them the cards and say, are you happy with the mixing or do you want to mix further? Well, at some point, they're going to say they're done, right? They're done mixing. Well, what you need to do is just catch a glimpse of the value, the identity of the top card. Okay, so you see that there's a king of clubs on top. Now, you don't make a big deal about that. In fact, you don't even draw attention to it. You're just secretly noting that. And it's very, very unlikely the spectator is going to remember. Oh, I seem to remember that the top card was the king of clubs. No way. <laughs> that's not going to happen. Okay, so you know the identity of the top card and that's the only one you need to know. Well, guess what? Using the under-down deal and knowing the identity of the top card, you can do something quite surprising. Okay, so you can explain and say, boy, there's this really interesting shuffle. It's called, she loves me, she loves me not. And um, if you do it in just the right way, it will actually finish with your favorite card. Now, of course, that's a fib, right? This is all drama here, right? And my favorite card, I don't know if you know this, but my favorite card is the King of Clubs. It always has been, okay? So you have, <laughs> let me, just an editorial note, you have to realize in the world of magic, you agreed to be fooled if possible. Right? You, you kind of sign up for that. So we can call this misdirection here, all of my little fibs along the way. Okay? Um, so you, know, you claim, that, oh, that's my favorite card. And you say, well, there's something special about this under down. It seems to always locate the person's favorite card. So let's see if it finds my favorite card. And so you do the under, down, oh, sorry, down. We're supposed to be doing... <laughs> She loves me, she loves me not. Okay. <laughs> she loves me, she loves me not. She loves me, she loves me not. Yes, no, 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 yes. That's a good sign. She does love me. Think about it. If there had been a different number of cards, an odd number, I wouldn't have finished with this. Okay, did it find my favorite card? What, what card did I tell you was my favorite card? And with any luck, the spectator will remember. I, I think it was, didn't you say King of Clubs? I did indeed. And then you reveal it and watch their eyes get big. Like, oh, wow. how did you do that? Okay, so that would just be a very, very simple use of the fact that you know where the lone survivor will be for the under-down deal given a packet of 16 cards. Okay, and then for the second one, 
where we use the down under, you just ask for um, 16 random cards again. Now, what you're going to do a little differently is you won't necessarily show them the card like we needed to do before to be able to glimpse the top. Uh, we'll go ahead and just have them mix it. And then you just take the cards from them. And we've done this before. It's a very common technique. You just turn the cards and then tap them. Tap them on the table as if you are straightening them up. Now, as you do that, even looking in the general direction of the back of this packet here, I can see that that is the ace of clubs. I can just kind of spot that out of the corner of my eye. So I don't need to look directly at it at all. I can look kind of some distance away. So you just tap it as if you're straightening things up and then think about it. If you are successful in doing that without de having them detect that, you don't know anything about the 16 cards that they chose. Okay, so a little, little different than here. We actually showed that we displayed them and had them decide if it was mixed well enough. Well there, technically, you both saw them. Here, supposedly, you did not, as a performer, see anything. Okay, so keep that in mind. So, and then you can say, have you heard of the Australian Shuffle? Because I've kind of discovered it recently. It's a really, really cool shuffle. Have you heard of the Australian shuffle? And most people will say no. Say, well, it's also called the down under shuffle. Okay, so let me show you how it works. You, you put this one down, and then the next one goes under, and then down, and then under, down, under, down, under, down, under, down, under, down. Under, down, 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 under, down. And it leaves you with a single card in the end. Okay? So that's called the Australian down under. So I don't know if you looked at just how confusing that shuffle is. You're taking off one and then the other one's going underneath and that one's going to come to the top and maybe it'll be dealt off too, you know. And so there's something called the lone survivor. The lone survivor is the card that survives the down under deal. Okay. And um, I've been playing with this shuffle a lot lately that I can actually successfully guess the identity of this card more often than not, more than 50% of the time. I can actually guess which of the 52 cards it is. Well, golly, the chance of doing that by chance alone is one out of 52. But I can do it more than half the time. Do you want me to try? Okay, great. Let me see. Sometimes I have to pick it up to kind of get a feel for it. Okay. Sometimes they make a sound too, depending on what the color is. I think it's black. Um, let's see, it's black. Well, it could be a spade or a club, of course, then. Hmm. My mind's eye, I'm seeing something, the outline of something that looks kind of like a club. So I think it's a club. And the value is a lighter than some of the others. In fact, it's really light. I'll, be, I'll bet you it's an ace. It's an ace of clubs. And this time I actually do feel very confident about that. So ace of clubs. Did I get it? I did indeed. I did indeed. I didn't even see the cards that you chose. Isn't that amazing? Just with some practice, I was able to do that. Maybe one day I can show you how. Okay, so however you want to sell these, okay? So all of these different little explanations, I make up on the spot. Now, maybe it looks obvious, maybe it's obvious that I do, um, but you can come up with so many different ways to explain why the outcome is surprising. And you can frame it in different contexts with funny little stories or 
situations of your own making. And really what is best is to draw on personal information you have about the individual, the spectator themselves. Okay? So if you know something about them, like for example, if, if they happen to be Australian, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> you can really take advantage of, of the fact that this is the down under shuffle. So, um, so it really is a matter of personality and imagination to come up with different ways of framing all of these, okay? So I'm, I'm kind of showing you uh, the mechanics, a little bit of the mathematics in just this brief boot camp series. Um, and hopefully I've given you some fairly decent narratives that you can use almost as is. But if you want to modify them or come up with your own unique ones, that would be wonderful. Okay, this next effect is called the clock arithmetic routine. And it involves this swapping procedure that we saw earlier in the series, okay? So let me go ahead and demonstrate it and then we'll talk about how I accomplished what I did, okay? So I have here 16 cards, as you can see. I have 16 cards I've grabbed from the deck. And um, now because we've actually shown you the cards, we probably better mix these up here, okay? So I want to mix, you know, I saw them, you saw them. Um, the goal, actually, of our activity today is to test the quality of your decision making, okay? So it's actually important that you not remember where things are. So uh, would you like me to stack left on right or right on left? Okay. Uh, why don't we go ahead and deal into four piles uh, just to be safe here. Uh, I don't want you to maybe remember anything about these cards. Now you want me to stack left to right or left to right? Okay, that's fine. Okay, maybe we'll do one more just to be safe here. I just don't want to compromise the integrity of our test here. Okay, you want me to stack left to right, right, left to right again? Okay, that's just fine. Okay, very good. So let me just set that down. Oh, I should mention that I have a written prediction over here. And I'm going to leave it in camera view the whole time. Okay, so that you know uh, nothing, no funny business has been carried out, right? Okay. So, how are we going to test your decision-making abilities? Well, what we're going to do, I'm going to deal these out again. Boy, these cards are <laughs> really getting scrambled here. Okay, there you go. So, I have two piles of eight cards in each. Okay, two piles of eight. So, what I'm going to do is just give you a whole boatload of choices. So, because we have eight in each, you're allowed seven swaps. Well, what's a swap? A swap is where you take the top card and you move it to the bottom. That is a, quote, swap, okay? So uh, let's go ahead and have you allocate those seven swaps however you would like, okay? It really is your choice. So how many would you like me to allocate here? You, you have up to seven of them. You want three? Okay, so three here and then four there. That's just great. So one, two, three, three swaps. We have four left. Uh, one, two, three, four. And then we'll set aside, uh, set aside this pair. I'll just put it over here. Okay, now we're down to six swaps left total that you can allocate to these piles, however you would like. How many do you want here? Just one? You sure? Just one. Okay, just one. One. Then we have a bunch of work to do over here. We have five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's six all together. We'll just set aside that pair right there. Okay, we're down to five swaps. How would you like me to allocate those? Zero? Are you sure? Zero here and five there. Okay, your choice. One, two, three, four, Five. Okay, we'll set aside that pair. I'll go like that. Okay, we're down to four. So you have four swaps. Two, two and two. Okay, that's kind of, whoops, sorry. That's kind of nice and orderly. 
So one, two, very good, and then one, two. And that will bring two unique cards to the top that we'll set aside. I'll put it right there. And now we're down to three. You want two, two here, and then one there. Okay, that's how that, sorry about the paper sliding. Uh, one, two, uh, let's see, one, two. <laughs> we're done, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and then one here. Okay, very good. I don't know how to count. These are big numbers for my brain here. Okay, you're allowed uh, two swaps. You want one on each? That's a nice way to go. One swap there and one here. Very good. That brings us a pair to the top. And now we're down to just one swap. Where would you like me to put it? Sure. Here? Okay, very good. I'll put it right here. And we'll set aside that pair. Now this, there's only one pair left there. Okay. Well, how do we know if you are a good decision maker? Okay, I'm really hoping that you used your intuition with those choices and didn't rush to judgment as to how you should allocate those. Well, I have a prediction over here. And after years of doing this very routine, I can predict, well, I think I can predict what your choices will lead to if your choices were good choices. Okay, wow. <laughs> we're both under pressure right now, aren't we? <laughs> okay, uh, prediction. All the pairs will add to 16. Hmm, let's see how we did. All, I'll leave my little paper there so you can still see it there. All the pairs will add to 16. How did we, let's see, five. Now Jack counts as 11, right? Yeah, that adds up to 16. What about these? Oh, that's clearly 16 for the total, right? You're doing well. Oh, <laughs> nine and seven, 16. Good job. Four and a queen, very good. Oh boy, that's a fail. That is a fail. Hmm, I was really hoping that you would get the, one of the highest scores or the highest score possible, but it looks like you're not going to quite make it. Oh, okay, you pulled out, a, pulled out of a nosedive a little bit there. 13 and 3, yeah, that's 16, all right. Uh, 4 and a queen, yep, 16. How about this one? 10 and a 6, that adds up to 16. Well, you did remarkably well, okay? So my prediction said that all the pairs will add to six, wait, wait a second. I do remember that I wrote something on the back here. Except for the red aces. Is that what happened here? It did indeed. All of them add up to 16, except for those silly red aces. They're left on their own. You nailed it. I had forgotten that I had written that on the back. You nailed it. You got 100% on this choice-making test. So anyway, that's the, that's the effect. Um, as I've mentioned before, you can come up with your own narrative as to how to frame this, okay? That's one I thought of just minutes before, as always, minutes before recording. I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll do it like this and see how it goes, okay? So if you give it a bit of thought and maybe more thought than I did, you can probably come up with something better than what I've just done there. Okay, so how does this work? Well, what was needed, and you know, we can't, um, in the boot camp series, as you know, we can't go too deep into the mathematics always with these effects because the videos, well, that's what the Hidden Structures online course is about. Um, but just recall, we're, we're in a good place right now, by the way. So the, the, right now in pairs, they're adding to 16. This is a good place. In fact, this is where I started. Um, in, in terms of building the deck, the packet, this is what I did. I built these very pairs, actually. We've actually recovered the very pairs that I set up. And then what I did was 
you'll note that this is, quote, an AMP relative to cards adding up to 16, except for this pair of red aces. All of the other pairs add to 16. And that's what I've written on the paper. I said all of the pairs will add to 16 and then on the back, except for the red aces. So this is an AMP relative to the pairings that I have in mind, right? Well, I need a mirrored structure for the clock arithmetic routine. I need it to be mirrored. So all I did was the same sort of thing that we've done in the Max Maven constructions. I just performed an over under, or you can do an under over, mange shuffle. This positions those cards in a mirrored relationship. And so this is actually, let me just move the paper, there's probably no reason for the paper here. Uh, this is actually the kind of thing that I showed you at the beginning. Now it won't be the exact same order, but it will be a mirrored packet. Mirrored in what way? That if you look at the mirrored pairs, so 6 and 10 add to 16, queen and 4, 16, king and 3. Oh, there's the two red aces. That will be the exception. Queen and 4, couple of 8s, jack and a 5, 16, and a 7 and a 9 is the 16. Okay, so just think back to what I did. So I, I said, well, you know, we, we both saw these cards, which is true. So I, I think to make this fair, we, we better mix these a bit. Well, this is a mirrored packet and I'm performing the LR shuffle. Well, the stay stack principle says this mirrored structure will remain. It won't be harmed. The cards, however, are being permuted, but the mirrored structure remains. That is the key. It's still mirrored. Okay, and then I even did four piles. Well, this is still the stay stack principle. Okay, stay stack principle. And it doesn't matter. You can stack from left to right or right to left. Okay, and then once you're convincing the spectator that the cards are sufficiently scrambled, that no one knows where things are, and that is actually true. I have no idea. I, and I suppose that when we saw the cards, and if we were geniuses and could track all 16 as we were doing those shuffles, then I suppose theoretically you could know the exact composition of the you know, exact order of this packet. Uh, but that would be a superhuman feat, I believe. So anyway, so I have no idea like what's on top or bottom. Well, there you go. I know that's on bottom, you know. Oh, by the way, what would have to be on top? Remember, this is mirrored. If nine's on the bottom, then seven better be on top because we know they add to 16. Um, so at this point, it's ready for this swapping procedure. So we just need a couple of mirrored piles, and that's what these are. Okay, so if you remember how this works, is the top card here is related to the bottom card there. Related, the relation here is that they add to 16, or there are a couple of red aces, right? Okay, and same thing here. This one, whatever it is, is related to the bottom one here, and it is. Their sum is 16, okay? So because, because, in fact, we may have actually talked about the mechanics of this in terms of under, seeing why the swapping procedure actually works, but if you think about this mirrored relationship, if we now, see we have eight and eight here, if you allow seven swaps total, what it does is it brings companion, so right now they're like, like this one's on top and it's companions way down there in the bottom. So if you perform the swaps, what, what it does is it brings them into alignment. So like this one, we can picture up here, this one's down there. And so as you swap, you're slowly bringing those two into alignment so that at the top, you take off these pairs that add to 16, or they're both red aces, okay? So I think the mechanics of the swapping procedure we've actually touched on earlier.
So anyway, that, that's kind of the setup for it. So you just need uh, uh, pairs that add to 16, except for whatever pair you want to violate that pattern. And this is a common magician's trick to say, oh, such and such is going to happen, and it doesn't quite happen. And then you turn the paper over, and it says, except for, and then it covers the exception perfectly. Okay, so that, that's kind of a ma magician's trick to pull on the spectator. Okay, so that is the clock arithmetic performance. And that is the last thing we're going to do. To, well, no, let's look at one more thing. I'm sorry. There's one more thing that we should at least mention here. Um, it's on our diagram here on the left. So if you come way down here, uh, because we have 16 cards, we could actually do a uh, read four minds at once. Okay. Now, if you've watched my video, it's called Beyond read five minds at once, it looks into the principle, the driving principle behind this incredibly popular video on YouTube. It's produced by the uh, cardtrickteacher.com and he, and he uses five packets of five piles of five. So that's why he calls it read five minds at once. Now I have a three-part series that goes deeply into what's happening there and extends it and introduces a whole, a whole bunch of other really interesting ideas along the way. Uh, but within that series, I actually do look at four piles of four. And so you may want to take a look at that. Um, it's a very powerful, very, very surprising procedure. In fact, it's one of the routines that seems to get the strongest kind of excitement from the spectator when you successfully pull it off. And it's partly because you can involve multiple spectators. Here you can involve up to four spectators and each one of them individually is remembering a special card that they saw. And then in the end, you're able to actually state the identity of their card with very little information given to you. So anyway, it's a very, powerful little routine and I encourage you to go to the Hidden Structures channel and watch my explanation of it and my extension of some of the ideas presented. So a big thank you to all of you who have, who have watched this rather long <laughs> Hidden Structures boot camp series and if you've gone through all of these videos you are certainly prepared to jump into the full Hidden Structures online course. So thank you, thank you for watching and take a look at my other series or some of my shorts or some of the other demonstrations that I have on the Hidden Structures channel.